han sover derude. Hvad siger du? Han er lige der. Ja. Nå, hvor hyggeligt. Hey, hey. Well then, it's 10 a.m. sharp. I think we can start with the webinar already now, although some people for sure will be dropping in already now. Um, continue to, to come in. Hello to everyone. I'd uh, like to give you a welcome to this webinar about um, recent developments in early warning systems. My name is Felix Oswald, and I'm very glad that you all decided to participate today and also would like to welcome you on behalf of my colleagues from the team behind the Neptune project. As would be um, Jacob Peterson from the region of Southern Denmark. There he is dealing with matters of climate adaptation, regional development, and also Kasper Gregersen from um, the water, Danish water cluster Clean. Uh, he will support us today with um, the technical issues if there should any issues should uh, arise, he's the guy to fix it, basically. Um, and we also have some guests I would like to introduce you to you today in the order of appearance. These are, first of all, Henry Baumann from Kiel University from the Chair of Automation and Control. And he is going to tell us something today about um, predicting cloud bursts with the help of radar data. I think this is a good idea to go to the next slide, by the way. Thank you. Um, and Henry is also part of the Neptune team. And then we also have some external guests, which I'm very glad to present to you today. And these are Professor Dr. Sven Tom Forde and Michael Spils, also from Kiel University, yet from another department, which is the Department for Computer Science. And they will present us today a recent the, their project. Um, for forecasting whirlwind floods at small inland streams today. And afterwards, you have a short recap and farewell. Before we actually start, I have some small technical uh, information for you. Um, you're very welcome to ask questions um, as we are going to be quite a bit, uh, quite some people today. And we kindly ask you to um, ask your questions after the presentations, unless they are really, really urgent. Um, you can do that by um, yeah, raising your hand and then uh, um, asking your questions in English in the best case, or also uh, in German or Danish, if that suits you better. Then we will uh, try to translate your question on the fly so that everyone can understand what the question is about and also understand the answer, hopefully. Otherwise, if you don't want to ask a question, please turn off your microphone and um, maybe even camera. Um, there's one other note, um, other information I would like to give you. We are going to record this webinar for yeah, purposes. Um, if it's not okay for you that um, you will can be seen later on in the stream of this video. We kindly ask you to turn off your camera and your microphone. And in this case, we would like to ask you to write your questions in the chat. And we will uh, forward these questions afterwards to the entire group. In any case, some technical issues should arise. Please just yeah, write it also in the chat or somewhere and then we will try and see how we can help you. Um, so next slide, please. Exactly. Um, also, to give you a short introduction to, to the project Neptune. Without Neptune, this webinar today would, wouldn't be possible. Neptune is a Danish-German um, Interreg project arising, uh, which funded during the Interreg 5A program period. We are almost through the project. As you can see, we have started with Neptune um, in the middle of Corona in March uh, 2020, and we are now about to finish it by the end of May 2023. There are 12 partners joining forces um, from both sides of the border. So we have uh, universities from Kiel and Sonneborg and Esbjerg, 
some municipalities or problem owners, for example, the region of the southern Denmark, the city of Flensburg, and also Kreis of Friesland, and also some uh, other clusters, companies. All in all, these are 12 partners who have their entire budget um, of almost 2 million euros. Yeah, the lead partner is the aforementioned Danish water cluster, Clean, which is helping us with the technique today. So for, for Clean, exactly. And at the core of Neptune are actually um, innovation collaborations. So in these collaborations, universities, companies, and problem owners work together to solve some technical uh, issues. And in the best case, the goal was to develop some prototypes. Um, some examples were um, detecting faulty sewer connections more efficiently than before. For, for instance, other example would be the recycling of carbon and phosphorus from sewage sludge. Also the optimization of uh, drainage systems, both in urban areas like in Flensburg, or in uh, very rural wetlands, as we have it on the west coast of uh, southern Denmark and Schleswig-Holstein. And one other, um, yeah, one innovation collaboration we would like to present you in a minute is the um, early warning system. Next slide, please. This one. And yeah, this also was a collaboration that was derived uh, out of the Neptune project. But besides the innovation collaborations, there are other activities going on in Neptune. So um, we're developing some sketch projects and we also had some meet the buyer events for existing water solutions and some other new prototypes. And last but not least, uh, it's also about knowledge sharing, which is exactly what we are doing today. And we present ideas from both sides of the border to the cases, the yeah, other side of the border. So ideas from Schleswig-Holstein to Denmark and ideas from Denmark to Schleswig-Holstein. That's for Neptune. So, um, and today we chose to um, present for early warning systems. And why did we do so? As you um, we all know, we are facing climatic challenges, like uh, the increasing probability for extreme um, events to occur more often. This could be floods, cloud bursts, etc. For instance, uh, the intensity of heavy rainfalls in Western Germany has already increased up to 19% in the last decades due to climate change. So we are in the middle of climate change already. And on the a map on the right, you can see the places um, where cloud bursts have occurred in Friedrich-Holstein during the last 10 years. <coughs> um, available, the available map uh, from the German Weather Association, the DVD, the link is on the right side. Yeah, and this trend, as you all know, is very likely to continue. And yeah, this is results in an increasing risk for flooding not only due to climatic changes, but also in the combination with other social or economic factors. We have more sealed areas. Um, yeah, the risk perception has changed and we're also facing uh, some sort of demographic change. And thus we need to adapt. Uh, um, urban planning is one obvious area for that, but it's also about disaster control. And when it comes to disaster control, um, time to prepare for the emergency is paramount. And this is exactly the reason, or one reason why early warning systems are becoming increasingly interesting. And especially as digital tools and algorithms are becoming better and better in the last years, um, yeah, becoming basically interesting. Next slide, please. And this leads me right now to our first um, presentation for today. It's an early warning system. Yeah, presented by Henry Baumann. He has worked also on the development of this early warning system together with colleagues from Danish water consulting companies and the city waterworks of the city of Flensburg. And once more, I would like to ask you to ask, um, ask your questions after the presentations, unless they are really, really urgent. So Henry, I can't see you right now, but the stage is yours. Yes, thank you, Felix. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I don't know if you have the picture of me at the moment. 
Okay, perfect. So yeah, today I'm going to present our early warning system, which we have developed in uh, the Neptune project. I'm in Revolver and I'm working at the Chair of Automation and Control, and I'm mainly working in the Neptune project. Our early warning system is a combination of digital models and data assimilation. And for small motivation, I want to just jump in uh, with the motivation from the city of Flensburg. This is the city of Flensburg, actually the harbor, how it should, like, it should look like when, it, when it's beautiful weather and it's a very, very nice city, but sometimes it looks like this. When uh, the Baltic Sea level rises and a lot of water is going into the city and the streets are flooded. And at the same time, when the Baltic Sea level rises, it rises typically a heavy rain event occurs. And then the streets can look like this on the right. Yes, it is not looking good, but we can't do something against it in those heavy rain events, but we can predict it and we can say when those events uh, will potentially occur and we can be ready for them. So going a little bit more into the situation of the city of Flensburg, you can see the, where is it? You can see uh, the Flensburg Fjord, which is going into this point into the city, and the city is basically laid around uh, where you can see the streets in grey and the channels in blue and red. The open channels uh, are marked in blue, and the closed channels, the pipe channels, are marked uh, in red in this point. To give you a little bit an idea of the dimension from the city of Flensburg, we have in total. A drainage system which is 230 kilometers uh, in total and we have a lot of uh, retention basins and storages. Sorry Henry, um, this was a question to put your camera on. You might have I, don't, I don't have the option to put my camera on. Oh. Then let's see. Maybe Casper can you make Henry visible for us again? No, sorry, I, I can't do that. So I just think Henry, just continue your presentation. Okay. Okay. Sorry for this. It's uh, it's not possible to share when sharing the screen. Okay. However, okay. Coming back to the city situation, the city of Flensburg, the channel network. We have in total um, a total volume of two hundred sixty-seven cubic meters, which sounds a lot, but this is actually just a, a five millimeter citywide rainfall for over one hour and thus uh, everything will be full. So if heavy rain event occurs, uh, this volumes will be uh, very quick full. And we are addressing the area of the Mühlenstrom, which is basically this area which I'm marking with the mouse right now. And this area has a total catchment size of 5,000 hectares. So a lot of water is accumulating and everything is uh, all of the water is going into the city and at this point is going drained into the Flensburg Fjord. At the same time, we have a big elevation difference from the backland areas to the Flensburg Fjord of about 50 meters in elevation. And therefore, a lot of water is accumulating and big gravitational forces are going with the water uh, from the backland into the, into the Flensburg Fjord. So, we would like to build an early warning system with different goals. The main goal, of course, is to have a prediction of heavy rain events and how the water level and the discharges uh, will result from the heavy rain events, what is changing in the system. The whole system should be reliable, of course, should be transferable to other municipalities, should be easy to set up, so other municipalities just have to have a model and then they can set up their own early warning system. It should be transparent in, in the way that it's not a black box, so you can look into the system, have a look and make your own modification if you want to. And of course, as a very big and important topic, it should be affordable, so not use very high cost um, intensive licensing tools. Okay, our approach in general, uh, therefore I give a small map of how we intend, of how we think of our early warning system. We have the real plant up here. Where we started the picture I've shown you before, and from this a hydrodynamical model is derived. So this is basically the first step. Um, therefore, the sensors and actuators which are included in the system are then also taken into account when the hydrodynamic model is set up. This, all of this is the first step basically, 
And as a second step, the radar, state, the radar station are giving information about the precipitation. And this is then also included in the hydrodynamic model to have a simulation from now to the future time. This is the second step. And in the third and fourth step, these are split a little bit. There you have to do a system monitoring step and the forecasting step. And after those steps, we have at the end a warning or an idea of how the, how the water level will evolve and how, um, how uh, dangerous it can become. Okay, stepping into the first step, the model. Um, in the modeling step, we have uh, three basic steps, which is to set up the channel or pipe routing, uh, the subcatchment runoff, how the water or the rain uh, have an impact on the system, and the surface water runoff flow. So coming to the first step, we have basically the pipe information. The channel and pipe information uh, contains information about the physical parameters, like the length of the conduits, uh, the diameter, and so on and so forth. And from this, a uh, basic 1D model can be set up, the 1D model with the channels. Additionally, to see the impact of the rain, we need the subcatchment runoff. And therefore, we have to use the surface information and the digital elevation model to create uh, the subcatchments themselves and the evaporation and infiltration of those subcatchments. And the last but not least step is, of course, the uh, surface water flow. Uh, this is typically made as a 2D approach, where all of the surface is modeled as a 2D model. But in our approach, um, we chose to have a 1D surface model. This 1D surface model is based on the idea that we have depression surface areas, uh, which are interconnected and water can be exchanged between the surface depression areas. To build these surface depression areas, we have the surface information and the digital elevation model. And from this, different thresholds on the depression areas can be set. So different depth of the depression can be set and then um, the, the areas are, are uh, marked and interconnected areas can be, can be obtained from the digital elevation model. So the basic idea, well, when water is going on the surface from the concrete, it goes into one area. And when this area is so charged, uh, the water can be exchanged again to the concrete through the main holes or to another surface area in both directions, of course. Uh, all of the information which I've uh, just mentioned are stored in the database, and from this database, uh, a final hydrodynamical model can be obtained. And we chose the stormwater management model, uh, so-called SWIM model, from the US government, which is uh, free of license, so it's an open source tool, and therefore many different parallel simulations can be run and information can be obtained from this without paying for each uh, license that is used. Um, the model in the city of Flensburg for the 1D model uh, is looking like this. We have the pipes uh, marked in blue, we have the number colors, and we have the, the sensors which are marked in the red, gray, uh, and the red dots. Um, those are not relevant at the moment, and some of them are already installed, some of them are not already installed. All right, and to show some results, we compare the measurements from the real system, which are marked in black, uh, with the simulated results, and one can see that the different peaks are estimated quite well, even the, the high flow, at uh, the one point is given quite well. Okay, coming to the next step, which is the precipitation. We have different radar stations in northern Germany, on whole Germany, and in Denmark as well. And from these radar station information about uh, uh, the radar is given. So based on this information obtained from the radar station, an image recognition is taking place where the clouds are identified and their movement based on historic uh, radar information, uh, can be extrapolated to the future. And with this extrapolation information about uh, the development of the, of the clouds, of their movement, and the potential precipitation is given. 
Uh, this extrapolation and image recognition step is then followed by the data assimilation, where the simulated or estimated uh, precipitation is compared to the radar station, uh, to the rain gauge information station, and at the end, the precipitation forecast is given out. So this precipitation forecast is given for approximately one to three hours in a one times one kilometer grid. And it can be given as a single time series or as an ensemble of time series, where the ensemble means that the rain, of course, is uncertain. It can be said that one predicted uh, rainfall time series is the perfectly predicted rainfall time series, but different ensembles uh, with different variation uh, of the different parameters is uh, given to the system and printed out. So the last or the pre-last step towards our early warning system is to have a system monitoring step where all of the information from the system is tried to be estimated because in reality, we have information about a couple of points where we have the measurements. I've shown you the map where the red dots are marked and we only have information about the water level in those red dots. But to obtain the information about the full system, we try to get the simulation close to the reality. And in this step, we do a state estimation approach. Where first, several simulations are run, and in those simulations, the rain forecast is taken into account, the control input on the real plan from the actuators is taken into account, and an old or initial guess is taken into account. And with this, several parallel simulations are uh, carried out and the result is obtained after a time step of delta t, which is in our case typically five minutes. After the step of the parallel simulations, uh, the data assimilation step is taking place where the real measurement from the real plant is taken and compared to the output of our simulations. And in this step, the correction is taking place where the predicted uh, states uh, are corrected in such a way that they are hopefully closer to, to the real system. And in this way, you know, we're trying to bring the simulation closer to the reality. And all of this approach is called the ensemble Kalman filter. Okay, coming to, to, to the results. At this point, I have to disappoint you a little bit because these are not the results from, from the real plant from the city of Flensburg since the server which we're trying to install is not perfectly ready, um, but thus these are simulation results at the moment. Okay, since the initial information is not given at, at the initial point, you can see that here are quite uh, big errors of above one meter, but this is because we don't have information initially, and after some hours of simulation, you can see that the, that the accuracy is going quite up and the nodes and storages are estimated. Uh, quite well, the depth and, and, and the flow in those. And I brought you the, the results from, from one measurement point where you can see with the ensemble prediction that we have a maximum, a mean, and a minimum value in red, blue, and green. And we have the real measurement in, in black. And as you can see, uh, those three, three curves or four curves are getting together. And thus, uh, the real um, sensor information are estimated quite well over the time, even in the case when the rain occurs and the water level rises in the specific point. Okay, coming to the forecast, so the last step to have, to have a warning. Therefore, again, we have the, the red, blue, and green curve, which are trying to approximate uh, the water level. And as you can see, when the, when the rain event occurs, it tries initially to, uh, to estimate how the future water level will rise. And the first guess is a little bit lower, but after more information are coming in through the measurements, the information, uh, the estimation is getting better and better. And at the end, we can see that the peak is estimated quite well and all the future points are inside the maximum mean and uh, minimum value. All right. This, these were information or results from our prototype I tested simulatively. And now I want to show how our prototype is looking at the moment, but there's of course uh, something to do on that. Uh, we have built a graphical user interface with a general overview where you can see information uh, about how 
which model is chosen. You can start the early warning system from this. Uh, some information about the current state of the simulation of the parallel simulation is given and which measurements are selected to be displayed. And they are displayed on, on the map plot, which is the second part, where you can see again the minimum, mean and maximum value uh, of those curves for the specific uh, sensor locations where actual physical sensors are installed or um, simply the results of the simulation. So even at points where no sensors are installed, you can get up, uh, information from the system and uh, how the water level will uh, evolve in those points. So at the end, some technical data. As I already said, we have typical sample times for the system um, system monitoring of five minutes. And since we have our one to three hour radar forecasting, uh, we have uh, two hours of forecasting time. At our examples, we have chosen sample size of uh, 20 different ensembles. And, uh, but this can be um, made a little bit up when the server is ready and when we have more computational power. All right, and we have uh, approximately 20,000 states, which are tried to, to be estimated. This is quite a lot, but with the 1D modeling approach, uh, the computational effort is going down compared to a full uh, 1D, 2D model. Okay, coming to a summary, um, our five goals, which we've defined previously, were the reliability, transferable, and uh, simple setup and uh, have a transparent and affordable system. Coming to those point a little bit more into detail, the reliability, since our system is not yet running uh, at the real plant, I wouldn't check that, but um, the simulation results are showing uh, good preliminary results. The system is of course transferable since you only need your model from your municipality or from your drainage system. This can be plugged into the prototype and then an early warning system set up, tool can be set up. And of course, it can be set up very simply. And it is transparent and uh, then the source code is open source and you can write directly, look into it if you have a little bit uh, idea of, of Python coding. All right, and affordable is also a big point since we use the stormwater, uh, the swim model, stormwater management model um, and no license has to be paid and therefore even though we're using 20 or even maybe 100 parallel simulations uh, no extra cost uh, are coming towards you so what are our to do's since the server as i already said in flensburg has been made ready on tuesday the final installation is not ready but we're working on it and the testing on the real plant will be then our next step after the installation is ready and for the forecasting, at the moment, we took the one year model for the forecasting step, but it could also be exchanged uh, so that uh, the system monitoring is taken on the 1D, so the adjusted channel model, and the forecasting is then taken uh, from the 1D, 1D model, so taking the surface into account. Possible extensions, just to name a few of them, with the combination with the risk analysis, where uh, you first take your risk analysis and uh, the risk analysis is then be combined uh, with a potential flooding uh, based on the early warning system. So a risk factor is coming out depending on an upcoming rain event. And of course, targeted or optimal control for the available, actu available actuators like the gates, pumps, uh, whatever is available in your system can also be taken to the prototype. And as I said, there are many more. If you are interested in that, please ask questions afterwards. And with this, I want to simply show which consortium set everything up. The problem owner is the TBZ Flensburg, who provided access to their facilities and, and provided the data for calibrating the hydrodynamic model, uh, which has been made by NNH Water together with Kjartan Raven. And the precipitation information is uh, obtained and provided by Hydro and Meteor. The knowledge partners in our consortium were the Christian Albrecht University and the Arbok University. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention and please feel free to ask your questions.
Okay. Thank you very much, Henry. <clears throat> and I can see one first question. I guess it's from Michel. Um, I know that there are forecasts further in the future, like a precipitation forecasts, but they are they don't have such a high resolution. Do you need this super high resolution? Have you have you tried anything with a lower resolution, but like further into the future? Um, at the moment, we just have taken the two-hour forecast, and as it looked like in the moment, we need the high resolution to have a good fitting. Uh, between the model and the real world. But once the system is set up, we can also combine it uh, with further forecasting uh, time. Great. Then we also have one question written in the chat. Mm, just to repeat it. What level, level of radar coverage is needed for this to be usable? I um, don't know, Henry. If you close your screen sharing, maybe we can then see you again. Yes, hopefully. So now you can see my screen again, or you can see me again at least. <laughs> um, we had the one, one kilometer grid, um, but it can also be a citywide range since it has been shown that the that the rain intensity doesn't change that much when we look above the whole city. So we have to te test that a little bit more. So, then we have a question from Lada Andersen about the results of testing uh, the early warning system in Weile also, Henry. Yes, I know you're knowing that we are testing this also in Weile. And we have not set up, as in Flensburg, we have not set up the server and made everything ready. But we are about to collect everything to make the model ready. And once the model is ready, uh, we are trying to set everything up in Weile. But we are not at the stage where we are finalized and we have uh, results from the early warning system in Weile. But this is the next step after 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 the system is uh, running in Flensburg. Okay, then I would have another question. Um, you know, the the early warning system you know, actually I think it's just an early warning system, and is it or is it intervening in some ways into the um, water control facilities? Yes, as I said, uh, there, there can be extension to, to targeted control. Um, but there it's a little bit difficult because we are not from, from the legal side, we're not allowed to have a direct impact into the system. Um, so if a targeted control tool will be set up, it will be more an assisting tool so that information about how potential control actuator settings could look like. Uh, if you want to obtain these or that goals. So we give a suggestion of how the, how the actuators could be set, and then the provider can at the end uh, set it by its, himself to see if he wants to do it or he don't want to do it. So then there is another question. Um, so, uh, yeah, right at, yeah, at the moment, um, starting with, oh, Lorde wants, you want to ask your question by yourself? So I'll just read it. Yes, I can do that. <laughs> and I can also introduce myself. I'm the project manager of, of Neptune, and I'm very happy with this project. Um, and so, uh, Henry, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the response we got so far from uh, TBZ Flensburg? What we heard on, on our last meeting that, that they were very happy because it gave them two hours ahead of making different kind of uh, of actions to prevent flooding uh, if they they got these early warning systems and uh, but maybe you can elaborate a bit uh, further and uh, tell about interest from other uh, water utilities too. Yes, of course. Yeah, they were very happy to get this tool set up. Uh, Cornelius from TVZ Flensburg was very excited about the modeling itself because it's a 
kind of a new approach with a 1D model and including the open source simulation software. This was a uh, big uh, attention which we've gained at uh, TBZ and uh, they are already spreading the information towards other water utilities in, in northern Germany at the moment, but we're trying to get more to the south of Germany. And yeah, the, the excitement was not to hide, even though the system is not already finally set up, but we just have simulation results. But we are going to address this soon, and once we have a running simulation, I think many other water utilities will be invited to Flensburg, and then they can spread the the knowledge and the running system. Uh, yes, and, and we also have to say that they can come to the final conference and uh, and talk with all the, your architects behind this model and get further information. And the final conference is at the 23rd of, uh, of March in, in Colling. But we will send information out after this meeting. Yes, right. Perfect. Thank you. Are there any further questions regarding the early warning system for Cloudburst? Yes, there's one question. I just have to see. Um, to what extent does the model incorporate the uh, changes in the sea level? Also, Good question. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. At the moment, we're more focused on, on the backland and the water which is going um, down the hill in Flensburg. So the water sea level is not included at the moment. It's just modeled as an as an outflow point. So simply the water is disappearing, but the, the tide could also be, or the, uh, the water level rise could also be included later. But at this point, at the moment, we're just modeling this as an outflow. So, um, yeah, I add that Flensburg luckily has no substantial tide inf tidal influence. So the water level, if there's no storm arising, is, um, yeah, varying on a longer scale usually. Okay. Are there, we still have time for some other questions. If there are other questions to this, this webinar, uh, to this um, presentation, sorry. Okay, that doesn't seem to be the case. So uh, we are pretty good in time and therefore I would suggest that we just get on with the next presentation, other early warning system. And it will be presented also by scientists from Kiel University, Professor Dr. Forde and Michael Spils. As I said, it's an early warning system um, leading to the um, yeah, forecasting flood events in the inland of Schleswig-Holstein, especially on small um, river, rivers and streams. And as I said before, I'm really glad that you take the time to present us your uh, yeah, project today. And, and also for you, um, yeah, feel free to start. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, I hope you hear me and you hear, uh, see my slides. Great, perfect. Okay, then, uh, sorry, uh, I can't switch on my video as well. So it just seems to be, well, stopped by Teams. But uh, we are two, so it's Michael and me who are talking. So at least one of us uh, is visible. Okay, before we start, just uh, a few words. Uh, my name is Sventum Forda. I'm leading the research group on intelligent systems here at the computer science department of Christian Albrechts Universität zu Kiel. And uh, Michel is one of my PhD students. And uh, from the background, that just means we are computer scientists. And uh, if you want to translate intelligent systems, what are we actually investigating? Well, we're working with artificial intelligence and machine learning, trying to develop new methods and basically using this to push it into technical applications in order to make systems more clever, smarter, and hopefully solve application problems. 
All right, and uh, what we'd like to do today is uh, to present you the current status and the context of the project uh, on which Michel is actually working and uh, to show you some first results that we have with the goal forecasting of flood events, now focusing on inland Schleswig-Holstein and then as said, based on AI. So I will start with a short overview of the project, then say a few words to motivation and goals, uh, say something about the current situation. And uh, we did some preliminary, preliminary study before we actually started with this uh, project. And in that context, I will hand over to Michael, who will then give you insights about the details of uh, what we achieved so far, including what is the scope of the project for the next remaining two years, which concludes then as an outlook. All right, so let's uh, start with this um, nice project. It actually started already in April last year. And on the right-hand side, you see a picture with the state minister Schröter, who came and uh, presented the award, the funding. So it is a three years project funded by the federal state of Schleswig-Holstein with roughly 250,000 euro. Uh, the title is uh, KI WAFO, uh, self-learning water level prediction for flood protection and hazard prevention. It's a cooperation between us, the computer scientists at uh, Christian Albrechts Universität and the Landesamt for Umwelt, so basically if you translate it, it's the State Office for the Environment. I saw in the participant list that at least one of these persons working there is joining today. So as some motivation, you, you all know what Schleswig-Holstein is, but I just wanted to uh, show it to you again. We are talking about a state who is absolutely surrounded by water. So on the one hand, the North Sea, on the other hand, the Baltic Sea. But inland, we have about 32 kilometers of running water. So it's, it's really a land about water. We have small areas with impact on the corresponding levels. So we have a lot of levels monitoring the current um, water level for the entire uh, land uh, state of Schleswig-Holstein. And all of them come with a small impact uh, small region, but large and fast fluctuations. On the other hand, we can observe that about 20% of all land is at risk of flooding. So it is flooding is really an issue. And like Henry already pointed out, this is not necessarily due to storm. It is mostly due to heavy rainfall. And therefore, the result is flood. And flood protection is a really central issue. So that obviously needs reliable models. It requires a continuous adaptation to the changing circumstances to well, climate change and all the implications that we have. And that is definitely not manageable manually. So the overall goal of this project is then to focus on this water level prediction on all these water level stations distributed over Schleswig-Holstein and try to develop accurate predictions of water levels using AI methods. So not standard hydrological methods, really data-based machine learning. And as Henry did, same scope, we want to go for an early warning at as many flood relevant level stations as possible and include this into the online system that is already in operation at the LFU. And what does AI-based intelligence mean in this context? Well, prediction just means to come up with a possible value which is assigned a certain uncertainty, saying, well, we guess it will be at this level, but we are not absolutely sure about this. So we try to come up with a certainty of uncertainty, or in other words, an independent quantification of this uncertainty. And using this, we then try to continuously self-improve the models we are developing in the sense that you see or you predict the value, you, you know the context, and based on the observation, what the actual outcome and the corresponding real value is, you try to continuously adapt and improve your models. 
So I already said that Schleswig-Holstein, sorry for the German uh, illustration here, but it's just a screenshot from the website of the LFU. Uh, it points out a bit the, um, the current situation. You see all these points are actually the corresponding um, water level stations. They are perfectly distributed if you know where the most important rivers are. So you see the Elbe region, you see the different major rivers and um, water levels somewhere in Schleswig-Holstein. Current situation is that this is already monit monitored and there are already warnings based on the current levels, but just using or just it's already good uh, option hydrological assessment on demand which requires active monitoring but that is not continuously possible through active uh, through experts because well you're working and you have working hours so that's the starting point where we started and uh, we did a first preliminary preliminary study from october 20 to april 22 where we started with one particular uh, water level station at Willenschaden that's close to Neumünster, so not too far from Kiel, where we took the hourly measured data of the last month and we tried to see how good could we be in order to predict the, uh, the level values and based on historical data and therefore show that it is basically possible with AI to outperform the existing models. After doing so for the first uh, level, we had a look into additional level, level stations, Tarp, Traja, Hollingstedt, with a spatial split of the precipitation and a corresponding forecast. So we increased the scope, looked into more characteristics and uh, compared prototype um, water level stations in order to see if still AI can outperform. And yeah, it was the case. So we extended it even further and uh, even extended the methodology we did in the background. Just to show you what the outcome was, this is um, one uh, result for the model phase, uh, of phase one. Uh, so you see uh, the actual data, which is uh, the uh, the red line. So that's the real observation that we have. And corresponding is the first um, model from phase one, which is the bluish one. You see, okay, we got the peak, but basically the goal should be to be as close to this um, observed line to the red one as possible. So hmm, we didn't manage the peak so good, but in the general behavior, it was good. Then we continue to work and you see currently we are, uh, our models are represented here by the greenish line. So we are, we are pretty good. If you now consider what is the actual challenge behind it, then the, you can already see from this illustration that, well, the standard behavior, so if nothing really extreme is happening, then most of the models are I don't want to say equally good, but at least they are usable. So the challenge is always if something really weird happens and weird especially means that you have a flood event. So in all cases where you want to be prepared and you want to take action afterwards, you need reliable models. And you see that here our phase one model was not so good because you see water level uh, actual value is one meter and 95 or something like that. Our prediction was two meter 35. That's a huge difference, uh, but it is much better than everything we had so far. So it, it was okay-ish, but still it is important to be in the same range as accurate as possible with low uncertainty. And you see now currently even these peaks are handled pretty good, but we are still in the process of working on it. So 
The outline of the project is that uh, we started with determining and pre-processing potentially useful data. So we looked into all the possible aspects that we could use in order to model an appropriate AI that is able to predict the outcome. Based on that, to develop reference models, so means train a lot of different AIs, compare them, and then Next steps is to work on the self-assessment of the AI uh, to self-optimize it and then, of course, evaluate and test it during use in production and integrate it, validate it in the context of the LFU systems. All right, so with this, I'd like to hand over to Michel so that he can say a few words of what we understand, what AI is in this context of this project, and then give you a rough idea of what we are currently doing. Yeah, um, so for us or for, for what I use for AI is pretty much just neural networks. Um, it's one of very many tools, but it's a very useful one. And what we do is, is deep learning. We construct deep neural networks for either, either prediction or, or classification. In this case, of course, prediction, how high is the water? And the way that it works is that we just show a model lots of lots of data. And then we hope that it can also uh, extrapolate from that how it will look like in the future. And that usually works pretty well. And what we, what, uh, what we then mostly do for machine learning is that we compare lots of different ar architectures and parameters. We can like you, you can make lots of reasonable, uh, reasonable assumptions on what works, but in the end, you pretty much just have to test all kinds of configurations. And then, yeah, you try to make the work, the network better and better. And in the end, you well, that, that that's a, that's a, that's what we do for the for the reference models. And what we do then is reinforcement learning. So we wanted to uh, we want to add a, another model layer on top of our reference models and combine our uh, and combine them. Uh, in a couple slides, we will see why that's important. But for now, it, we just need to know we, we have different models. We can combine them, and um, yeah, we may, maybe we even want to reweight them. And we want to, we want our model to to recognize abnormal behavior. Um, so what did we do so far? Uh, we redefined really data sets. We mostly get them from our partners at the LFU. And some we get from the DVD, so the German weather service. And yet it's pretty much all data that's publicly, publicly, publicly available. Some of it you need to manually scrape, but you can pretty much get all the data you need for any gorge you want. Uh, we have developed reference models, several thousand actually, mm, and we spend a lot of time of, on software engineering. So we want our software to be adaptable. We want to be able to just take the software, change pretty much nothing except some configuration and use it everywhere in the world. And we want to be able to interpret our results. We want to be able to say, okay, this model works well in these cases I, uh, or for these metrics. And we want to be able to, to just immediately see that and not, well, just poke around in the dark. Um, yeah, what, da what data do we actually use? Uh, usually we just use nearby sensors and then some radar data, some forecast data, and we do a little bit of feature extraction but mostly just, just raw sensor data. So what do we need to have? We have, for example, how wet is the ground? How wet is the air? How warm is it? Uh, how high or how much, weather, uh, how much water is flowing upstream and downstream? Uh, what is the current precipitation? Or what was the precipitation during the last couple of days? What is the predicted precipitation, precipitation in the catchment for the next couple of days? Or up to 48 hours, and of course, uh, what is the water level? Or what is the gauge that we are trying to get to predict? Um, 
you can add some more data and you, depending on how large your catchment is, you can uh, add, well, split all, all of these features into different features, but that's, that, that's general just, just of it. These are the, 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 that's the kind of data you need. Uh, for feature extraction, we tested lots of different things, mostly, well, time series features. You ha can have a st statistical, temporal, and spectral features, but it turns out they pretty much don't do anything for us. They slightly improve the model in some cases, but they also make it much, much slower, and uh, it, it just wasn't really worth it. And it, it was, it, it led to some very erratic behavior. Uh, could you go one slide back? Yeah, the, the time series features led to some very erratic behavior in case something was measured wrong. So we dropped that. Uh, time series aggregation. Maybe we don't actually need to input all the hourly measured data for the last seven days. Maybe we can just take the last three days hourly. And before that, we just take the average. Uh, also didn't work, uh, but what turned out did work is differencing. So we don't actually try to predict the water level, we try to predict the change in water level. Uh, this works better because uh, it removes seasonality and trends. In this case, we do not really have trends, um, but we have seasonality. So of course, in the water, uh, in the summer, water is generally lower and the winter is a little higher. And if we remove that, we just have more data. We have, uh, it's all about equal and it, it, it helps massively to improve the model. Yeah, what kind of architectures do we use? Um, either classic LSTMs models, LSTM models, long-term, short-term memory models, uh, which are specifically designed for time series and say, you just show them each data point after another, and they try to remember what they have seen. And the other, uh, what do we, oh, the other model version that works surprisingly a little better are very deep residual networks with a couple hundred of with a couple hundreds of layers, um, which are all just fully connected. But they use the prediction for the next hour as input for the pr uh, prediction in two hours and so on. Next slide, please. Yeah, before in the earlier phases, we also tried all kinds of different architectures. For example, convolution, We will, maybe we could smartly convolute over space or time to reduce our input and well, extract some useful features. But all of these old architectures just turned out to perform worse than residual or LSTM architectures. Yeah, assembles. Uh, why do we want assembles? Why do we need assembles? Um, here you see on, on each plot is one model uh, and each line is uh, the prediction for one potential rain forecast. So the, what the, the, from the German weather service, we get uh, precipitation forecasts and they have an ensemble forecast, which means uh, they calculate 20 different forecasts with slightly di from slightly different starting conditions. And as you can see, the red line is, uh, is the forecast for the main prediction. The green line is the forecast for, uh, is the, the actual measure, measured water level. And then we have all these fin dotted lines somewhere around for the, for, uh, the actual truth. And well, they're all around. We, we don't know which, which forecast will actually come true. And some of them are closer to the, uh, some, are, some of the forecasts are very useful for us to predict the, to, to come close to the actual values and some of them are less useful, but it's not always the same. Uh, next slide, please. Here again, uh, pretty much the same, four different models with uh, in, in, in for the thin lines and mean. The mean is the is the average prediction, which in this case is the closest to the actual measurement. 
And that's something that very often happens in machine learning models. We have, if we can take, we can take a bunch of different models and take the mean, and that is generally closer to the truth than each single model. Um, and now the challenging part is to decide which of these model for this situation is better, which should we just totally ignore? Should we, uh, to, should we weight them? Uh, here, they are all about equal. Maybe we should weight the model two a little less, but that, that's pretty much our research. How can we determ determine which model is bad in which situation? Mm. Yeah, I think that's it for the slide. Yeah. Okay, what, what are the limitations for our model? So we are, we are, we have designed our architectures for small catchment. We have no knowledge about events that are more than a couple of days ago because we don't need them. We don't have any melting glaciers or similar stuff. Um, and we also have fairly, fairly short streams. We, we don't need to know what, what the water is like a thousand kilometers upstream because that just doesn't exist. So if we have a system where we do have, where we need this information, we would have to change some, some of, uh, something on our input data. Um, additionally, we also expect a high resolution precipitation forecast. Well, fairly high, not as high as for the previous project, but still about 2.2 uh, times 2.2 kilometers. And well, obviously, rain, uh, rain forecast massively helps predict how high the water will be. And this kind of uh, forecast is not available everywhere, but luckily it is in Denmark and Northern Germany and well, most of Europe. So it's fairly easy to adapt everywhere nearby. Mm. Yeah, what, our, what are our next steps? Like I said, uh, the assembles we want to know which models are good in which depend in which situations we want to know how certain are our models which is always very challenging for neural networks they're always very confident they say this is correct and uh, you cannot convince them otherwise um, and then self-optimization we want to find out we want we want to be able to recognize has the situation changed? Do we need to retrain models? Do we need to completely throw a model away? Um, maybe something massively changed in, in a river and we can just throw all our models, models away and we want to be able to automatically recognize that. And if that happens, generate new models, combine models and weight them. Yeah. Okay, so that is basically what we wanted to tell you. Thanks, Michael, for the results. And uh, here, just to name the contact details and especially say thanks to our cooperation partners from the Landesamt für Umwelt, Abteilung Gewässer. And uh, this is especially Ralf Hach, who is working pretty close together with us. So thanks for your attention. So once more, you now have the time to, and um, yeah, chance to ask your questions about this presentation, which I would like to thank you very much for, Sven and Michel. And now we have the time for more questions. Okay. Yeah, it seemed to be that people still, um, yeah, it seemed a bit, I don't know, maybe flabbergasted. Now we have one question from Alexander. Do you want to, um, yeah, go ahead, Alexander. Yeah, hello. Uh, Alexander Schaum, also here from Kiel University. Can you hear me well? Yes. 
Perfect. Uh, yeah, so uh, when you commented that uh, with respect to this uh, reliability of your models, uh, the decision whether you need to retrain them or not, um, how would you basically proceed? Uh, so you, you mean, uh, so what we currently do is that we have just a lot of models and uh, we first now look into the question how to weight them and to combine them that's the first step of the model but you you're already one step beyond that you say okay uh do you want to retrain or and and how do you uh, do this uh, and how do you decide about this is this correct the question yes exactly because i think that was kind of the last point mentioned on the slides yeah, exactly. Okay, thanks. Then I got the question correctly. So, so basically, uh, well, that is part of the research that we need to do. But uh, the idea is that you could observe the history of each um, each model. So basically, when we say reweighting, that depends on the context. So we say, what is the current trend? What is the what are the external conditions? We take this as modeling some sort of state and based on that we try to learn what is the combination and therefore decide about the reweighting, which means in addition that we keep track of several performance parameters of these models and uh, which which includes that we can now say if there is a certain model which is never useful or which always comes with only a very tiny uh, fraction in the weighting process uh, for all conditions. So not only for standard behavior, but also for any kinds of peak situations that we observed so far, then that is an indicator to say this model is not useful and therefore we can sort it out and retrain it or do something with it. So that is one thing, and that is just the binary decision. And actually uh, what you can do and what we will do, that's the path we plan to follow, is to use this um, observational data for the corresponding context and turn this into some kind of certainty values for the models. And by that you could re-rank and decide which could be or should be retrained or at least updated in any kind. Okay, <clears throat> yeah, Good. thank you very much. Sure, welcome. Okay. Then we have another question written in the chat. Um, um, it's about the measurement stations, the couches. So what happens if an other sensor is installed in the study area, for example, in a small river? Do all the models have to be retained then? So, it, okay, Michael, go ahead. Well, we can just keep the old models and train new models that just use the additional data, but a new sensor is also not immediately useful because uh, machine learning models need a lot of training data first. So if we have a new sensor, we can wait a couple of years and then we have it, enough data for, uh, well, for a potentially better model if, it, if the sensor turns out to be useful. But it's not a problem to just keep the old uh, models running with just a reduced uh, data set. Exactly. And just as an add on, uh, part of uh, what we're doing in terms of customizing, adapting, re weighting uh, models at runtime during or with the feedback of observation uh, is meant also as a means to allow for transfer and customization of um, existing models. So if you install a new sensor with at least the same scope of measurements, then the idea is to automatically select um, sensor stations that come with the same characteristics and expected behavior, use their models as a first setup, and then retrain them based on the observations that you do so that you have not a cold start but well not 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 really a hot one but let's call it a warmish start so that you start with some basic knowledge and re-adapt so your 
much, much faster in the learning process. Okay, are there any further questions? Uh, there's, there was another one in the chat. Uh, yes. Before Henry. Before Henry, yes, that, oh yes, sorry. Um, so I just shall repeat it. Uh, do you have any ideas why the actual water level in the beginning was five or 10 centimeters higher, uh, ahead, higher than the um, water level in the model? And then later the actual water level was somewhat lower than the actual prediction. Maybe it is yeah, that's large. always, yes. Uh, yes. I think about the slide I'm, I'm showing right now. That's always very hard to tell with neural networks. I would assume in this case, there was some backflow. Uh, I think we do not have a downstream gorge for this model, but it's that's pretty much just guessing. It could be there some backflow or it could just be that there was unexpectedly more rain than any of the assembled forecasts for the precipitation assumed. Um, but it's hard, very hard to tell for sure. Yeah, in the beginning here, it's uh, like four to five centimeters higher. And well, for this model, it stays that way. Yeah, and, and, and here we are, uh, our, assembly, uh, our mean prediction is lower at the beginning and higher afterwards. Uh, these charts, yeah. Great, so I didn't have also um, a question, which is um, it's always an interesting whether you can um, transfer a model or application from one area to the other. So if I would like to um, have a small river catchment um, somewhere in my municipality or somewhere, and I would like to use your model and um, then I need to have some, yeah, a sensor data to, to train the model, so to say, um, what preconditions must the sensor fulfill, so to say? Yeah, well, it depends uh, on what kind of sensor you're using, but if the data that you provide is actually corresponding to what we currently use in the model, so like Michael pointed out, uh, the corresponding values, plus uh, that we have an interface for calling data from DVD, then uh, then it's it's not an issue to transfer it. So that's that's basically the major idea of the project, that it is uh, not dedicated to one particular use case. It is a generalized model. And uh, we provide a, a system that is easily adaptable and transferable to any kinds of new installations. Okay. Uh, what would be important is that there are no jumps. Like if you suddenly change uh, the normal level, and you have a jump of 50 centimeters from one point to another up and, and, and change that away, then that's something you would have to, well, take into account and probably remove. Okay, so the sensor could also be new installed then, or is, would it be still better if the sensor has been in place a couple of years already? Well, if, you, if it has been in place, then you have hopefully historical data that makes everything easier for us. Uh, but anyways, in general, if the project works as we expect it to work, then we should at least be able to provide something that works reasonable in the beginning directly with, even though you don't have uh, historical data. But uh, then of course, uh, this will definitely result in lower accuracy, which over time should then decrease. So don't don't expect too much from the beginning, although I guess that it will work okay. -ish. Thank you very much. Okay, are there any further questions? Just feel free to yes. Mm, just one question from 
will there be a calibration of the forecast for each river take um, takes into account the uh, retaining capacity of the system? Yes. Okay, so if I get the question correctly, you are asking about the, uh, well, let's say the overall conditions and uh, impacts that uh, the concrete station has. And uh, well, the uh, what we are doing is that if just looking on historical data, including all the environmental data that you can access and that turned out to be useful, we are not modeling any kinds of restrictions like how much is the capacity or is there any kinds of amount of possible retaining capacity or anything like that. So it is just implicitly modeled by the historical data and therefore we don't explicitly push this into our models, which in turn is one key feature because therefore they are in general generalizable and don't need to be manually adapted to the conditions of your particular installation. Maybe I should add there, there is another, uh, Google has a project also for flood forecasting, but mostly for larger rivers. Um, they do something like that. What they do is they train one model which is supposed to work for, well, pretty much any catchment in the world or any large catchment. And what they do is they uh, add data like retaining capacity as a, as a feature. So they train a model, well, with with pretty uh, with meteorological forcing data and not with, well, the, the, the kind of sensors we use. And then they also add for each, uh, when, when they train the model on different catchments on different rivers, uh, how large the river is and well, all, all kinds of uh, describing values, but I don't have an exact list of what they use. Um, yeah, we well, we, we use the respective data of each river in the way that we use the historic level, uh, water levels, but we don't use information like how long it is. Um, that's information that the model is basically supposed to learn by itself. Um, but it, it's just not, not uh, it, it's something we presented in, inside the model, but not very re human readable. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that, that answer. The, that was the answer to, but you use the respective yeah. data of each river. Exactly, yes. Um, I would like to also ask one other question um, because if it comes to water management, sometimes it's also an idea to change the sort of um, river bad habit, for example, create some retention area. So provide more room to a certain river to um, reduce the water levels. What would happen to the model if, for example, we set back a small levy and provide more room to the river, which also affects the water level? Would that confuse your model then? Or uh, in, the then? in the first place, uh, if you do this abruptly, then probably our model will be less accurate. So directly after your intervention, changing the topology, uh, you will see that uh, probably the model will be not as good as it was before. However, due to observing uh, the behavior and the outcome of the predictions or the deviation of prediction and observed data using this as some kind of learning and feedback signal, over time, the system will adapt to these changes and therefore re-optimize the models depending on the observations it does. But this may take some time, so that's the drawback. All right, so we still have another question um, about the um, artificial intelligence. So how fast um, does it move from historical data or maybe training purposes to present data? Does it take some months or years? Well, the, the answer to this is it depends. So if, we, uh, if we're talking about uh, events that uh, are happening more often 
or that are coming with a bit more severe impact or anything like that, then in general, they are available in the historical data. And therefore, as soon as we learned it, uh, or the model learned it, it's not an issue. So we will somehow predict it or be able to predict it and over time be more accurate in predicting. But if it comes to uh, cases like uh, Felix already outlined, where you change the topology or the general implications for this particular uh, water level station, then I'm not so sure how, it, how long it takes because actually your, your model has seen or has to see all these things that it needs to predict. If there's something completely entirely new, then it will be not able to predict it because it just doesn't know what to do. But that's the same for us humans, that if we see a machine and we never saw how this worked and what it is dedicated to, then well, we could just say, I don't know. And that is basically what our system is, is doing. In this case, not saying, I don't know, coming up with the best guess it has and then try to adapt over time. But I'm not so sure how long it will take. I'm sh So if, if you're talking about an event that never happened before and now it happens once and the next time after a decade, then of course it takes decades to learn. But if you have something that happens now and again, uh, then in weeks, then it takes obviously weeks. So it is depending on what effect you're searching for. Great, thank you also very much for that answer. Are there any further questions? If that is not the case, I guess we can go back to the last couple of slides. Thank you very much, Casper. So, um, and with this, yeah, I would like to slowly come to an end of today's session. I think we all have learned a lot in the sense, um, yeah, that I'm once more very impressed what digital tools can actually do today from, yeah, provide solutions that are applicable at many places, process, impressive amount of data and it also shows us that still we need um, this in situ measurements we need a census in the rivers and everything that led to keep these digital machines running and producing good results and i also think that we are very, very curious to yeah about the future outcomes of both systems and yeah wish you all the best for your f uh, further research and testing. By the way, if you are interested in the outcomes of the other co innovation collaborations and the other project outcomes of Neptune, you are very um, invited to yeah, visit our web page. It's uh, written in the, in the slide um, www.neptunewand.dk. Uh, also, provide us some information on LinkedIn. And finally, if you're really, really curious, you're also very warmly invited to Neptune's final conference. As we already mentioned, and Neptune is almost coming to an end in a couple of months. There we will present results and prototypes. Yeah, in, yeah, in great, also in detail and also the other systems um, also have the climate expert, Sebastian Merdel from the Danish University of San Denmark as a guest speaker. This final conference will take place on the 23rd of March. I think it's the wrong month written here. So please do not drive on the 23rd of February to calling, but we want to wish you on the 23rd of March. And you're also uh, invited to the voluntary excursion on the 24th of March, one day later then. The place of the final conference will be Fulkerts Fulke in Kolding and the entire session apart from final dinner uh, is free to attend. And I think in the end, I can say that we also will share these slides of today's presentations with you so that you can 
um, go through them once more if you're interested. And I think they also can find the contact data of our speakers today. So one more time, I would like to say thank you. Thank you all for participating today, um, for attending, for creating this great interest. We're really happy that we had up to uh, 50 people doing, at this webinar. I especially want to thank you for um, Henry, Sven and Michel for presenting the, your really up-to-date status of your projects. And yes, and Casper for the technical support. And then, yeah, the only thing I have to say is have a nice day. And yeah, see you maybe at the final conference or somewhere else. Have a nice day.